So we're talking about the uterine or menstrual cycle, which is of course fundamental to human reproduction. And an idealized cycle starts in day one. Uh, the middle part is day 14 and the end part is day uh, 28. So that would be an idealized cycle. Now day one is the onset of menstruation. Now menstruation is the sloughing off of the stratum functionalis, the inner layer of the endometrium. So the endometrium, the inside layer of the uterus, is in two layers. Now this layer here, between these lines where I've written my numbers, this is the permanent layer here. And this permanent layer is called the stratum basalis. So that's the stratum basalis, that doesn't change. But this functional layer, the stratum functionalis on the top does. And menstruation, as we've said, is taken as the first day of the menstrual cycle. Now, this bit I'm drawing here, this second bit, is, is the functional layer. So that's going to degrade in the first few days of the menstrual cycle. And that is actually when menstruation takes place. Those first few days, that is, that is menstruation. I mean, the number's completely arbitrary. We just take day one as the first day of the menstrual cycle, as the first day of menstruation, because it's the day we can be certain about. We, we can see it, it's obvious. And then after that, in the uterine or menstrual cycle, there's going to be a build-up of the thickness of the endometrium like this, getting thicker towards the end of the month. And then there's going to be a drop-off again at the end of day 28 as we have the, the onset of the next menstruation for the next cycle like that. So we have these, uh, the, this 28-day cycle here. So we're thinking about specifically the uterine or the menstrual cycle at the moment. That first part there is uh, menstruation. We're going to get menstruation. Then we're going to get an increase in the thickness of the functional layer of the endometrium. So that's called the proliferative phase because it occurs as a result of mitosis. There's a proliferation of cells. Then this last part here is called uh, the secretory phase. The secretory phase. And that secretes nutrients which are going to be useful if any uh, fertilised embryo comes along to implant itself in, in this nicely prepared functional layer of the endometrium. So we see a menstrual phase. And we've said that ovulation in an ideal cycle occurs on day 14 if it's an ideal cycle. So that means that this bit here is before ovulation, so after the menstrual phase we have this uh, pre-ovulatory. We have this pre-ovulatory phase here, just there, before, before uh, ovulation. And uh, after ovulation, this next part is called the uh, post-ovulatory phase. So there are the changes in the uh, endometrium. That's why we're calling this part the uterine or, or the menstrual cycle. Now it's this pre-ovulatory phase uh, from day one to day 14 that tends to be the variable component. Uh, from ovulation to the end of the cycle is much more consistently 14 days. So the length of the cycles can vary significantly. It could be 24 days, anywhere up to say 35 days. But if it's the second 14 days that are consistent, then if there's a 24 day cycle, then that would mean that ovulation occurred on day 10, 14 days before the end of the cycle, or 14 days before the onset of the next cycle. Or if it was a 34-day cycle, that means that ovulation would have occurred on, on day 20. Now, all of this, of course, is controlled by the endocrine system. So up here, as you probably know from previous videos, we have the hypothalamus and we have the uh, pituitary gland on its stalk and the pituitary gland is in two lobes and the lobe we're interested in is the anterior lobe, the adenohypophysis. So a cycle will begin with activity in the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus will produce gonadotrophin releasing hormone and that will pass down the portal system from the hypothalamus to the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. So that starts, we start off in the hypothalamus. And this gonadotrophin releasing hormone will go to a group of cells in the 
adenohypophysis in the anterior pituitary called the gonadotrophs. And the gonadotrophs will respond by releasing the gonadotrophic hormones. That is the follicular stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. And this is all going to be mediated via the uh, ovarian follicles. So let's have a look at what's going on. So a baby girl is born with tens of thousands of primordial follicles. These are immature follicles, a simple layer of cells, and inside there's a oocyte, a potential ovum, stuck in an er well, it's not stuck, suspended in an early phase of um, meiosis. So they're up there like that. Now the reason puberty happens, or the reason any menstrual cycle happens, is follicular stimulating hormone will stimulate these follicles. It does exactly what it says, it's a follicular stimulating hormone. So the gonadotrophin releasing hormone stimulates the release of the gonadotrophin from the gonadotrophs. And the gonadotrophin we're interested in at the moment is the follicular stimulating hormone that's stimulating our follicles. And initially it's going to start stimulating the uh, primordial follicles, these immature follicles. And it's going to cause cell division in these and we're going to develop primary and then uh, secondary follicles and eventually we're going to develop a mature follicle and the mature follicle is called the graphian follicle. And we've actually seen this before in, in, in a diagram here where we have an immature follicle just there and this is acted on by the follicular stimulating hormone that causes mitosis and growth of development there's some secondary follicles developed and one of these becomes the dominant follicle. And we can see that there's lots of granulosa cells in this, uh, in this follicle here and indeed in the earlier stages of follicular development. Lots of these granulosa cells. So let's think about the, what these uh, secondary follicles and mature graphene follicles are like in more detail. So um, several secondary follicles will develop and the cells in these are uh, the cells in these are the granulosa cells, and then eventually one will become the dominant follicle, and we have a large follicle with many of these granulosa uh, cells, as, as we saw in this diagram. So the ovum is in here, the developing ovum's in there. There's fluid, and there's many of these uh, follicular cells. Now what actually happens here is um, this is going to produce the oestrogen. The granular cells are going to produce the oestrogen. And as it produces oestrogen, the dominant follicle produces oestrogen. And that oestrogen is going to go back in the circulation to the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. And the high levels of oestrogen from the developing follicle are going to inhibit the release of further follicular stimulating hormone. And what this means is that the follicle that's producing the, uh, the most oestrogen is going to become the dominant follicle. So we end up with one dominant follicle. Now sometimes this doesn't quite work and we can have two dominant follicles. And in that case, that means two ovum can be released. And if two ovum are released and fertilized in the same menstrual cycle, that means that um, non-identical or uh, dizygotic twins can be the result. So we've said that this is producing, uh, the follicular cells are producing lots of oestrogen. And it's the oestrogen from these follicular cells that are going to stimulate the development of the endometrium during the first half of the menstrual cycle. So the gonadotrophic releasing hormone stimulates the release of the gonadotrophin, which is the FSH. That stimulates the development of the follicles, but it's the follicles that release the oestrogen that cause the development of the endometrium. So we're going to get growth, proliferation and increased vascularization of the endometrium, preparing it for possible implantation. Now at day 14, the activity of the other gonadotrophic hormone 
um, becomes increased. There's a, there's a spike in increase of the other gonadotrophic hormone and that one is a luteinizing hormone. So we've got that in green. Remember the blue one was the, uh, the follicular stimulating hormone. So, but now at around about day 14, 14 we're going to spike in the production of luteinizing hormone. And what the luteinizing hormone does is it uh, causes ovulation. So the granular cells are still going to be there, but the, the ovum is going to be released. So the ovum goes out and is released where it can potentially be fertilized. So it's the spike in luteinizing hormone that actually triggers the process of ovulation, which of course is good because it gives us the potential to reproduce. But also the luteinizing hormone changes the nature of the granulosa cells. We've seen that on this diagram. The granulosa cells now become what we call luteal cells. They're luteal cells. Luteinizing hormone means that the yellowing hormone, th th these take up fat and become a yellowy uh, colour. And uh, it changes from being called the graphian follicle at this stage to being called the, uh, the corpus luteum. As, well, it will be a few hours after the luteinizing hormone has, has, has been acting on these, on these cells to change them into luteal cells. And we get a collection of these uh, luteal cells now. in this corpus luteum, corpus body luteum, yellow, yellow body. So we now have a collection of luteal cells. And that's why we call this first half of the cycle here, that first half we refer to as the follicular phase. And this second half we refer to as the luteal phase of the cycle because of the presence of the corpus luteum there. Now the corpus luteum does carry on producing some estrogen but it also produces large amounts of uh, progesterone. So the corpus luteum is going to produce progesterone and we'll draw the progesterone in, uh, in black I think. So the progesterone from the corpus luteum is going to influence the endometrium of course and it maintains the endometrium. So estrogen is a developing hormone, progesterone is a maintaining hormone. And this corpus luteum will stay around for the second half of the cycle, the second 14 days of the cycle, and it will carry on producing progesterone. It produces some estrogen as well, but it produces progesterone to maintain the developed, the developed stage of the functional layer of the endometrium. So we're now in this uh, post-ovulatory phase here. So the ovarian follicle has released the ovum and is now called the corpus luteum. We are in the luteal phase. And the luteal cells are going to produce some estrogen, quite a lot of progesterone, and they also produce another hormone called relaxin and relaxin prevents contraction of the muscular layer of the uterus, the, the myometrium, because we don't want any fertilized products to be injected as a result of over vigorous uterine activity. Now if fertilization doesn't occur the corpus luteum is just going to degrade as, as we've said after 14 days and it forms a residual non-functional structure called the, uh, the, uh, the corpus albicans, but that's basically it done its, done its job and that's finished now. But because of the development of the, the corpus albicans, the progesterone is no longer produced. The progesterone no longer maintains the vascularity of the endometrium and that's why we get the onset of the next, the next menstrual cycle. Now, if there is fertilization, then the corpus luteum will be, uh, it will persist. And it's actually supported by human chorionic gonadotrophin produced by the chorion of the embryo eight days after fertilization. And uh, 
This of course is very useful because it means we can test for pregnancy at a relatively early stage by testing for uh, human chorionic gonadotrophin in the blood or urine. Now we did mention that this is also called the, uh, the secretory phase in terms of the activity of the endometrium. Because if ovulation is going to, well ovulation occurs on day 14, but if fertilization occurs, the, the released ovum is only going to last for 12 to 24 hours in the internal environment. So if fertilization is going to occur, it's going to be around about this stage of the menstrual cycle. Now that's not the only fertile period, of course, because sperm can last for, uh, well, probably five, five, some people even say more, realistically five days in the internal uh, female tract or even potentially more. So sex occurring any time in, in this period can result in fertilization. But if fertilization is going to occur, the actual act of fertilization, not necessarily the act of sex that brought about that fertilization, but the actual fertilization is going to occur uh, around about day 14, 15 in this idealized cycle. And fertilization, if it does occur, uh, occurs high in the fallopian tube, so it's going to take about a week for the embryo to get down. So if the embryo does come down, it's going to arrive about here. And that means that the endometrium is secreting nutrients such as glycogen to support it before the uh, placenta develops. So interesting levels of control here from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary, to the follicular cells, to the luteal cells. The follicular cells stimulated by the follicular stimulating hormone, the luteinizing hormone stimulating ovulation and the uh, activity of the corpus luteum and the luteal cells.